Hi there, it's Don Mino. We're going to talk about radio in your home and my home on this evening's program. Radio was developed in the late 19th century, early 20th century. There's about a half a dozen inventors that put together ideas, and they were all miles apart. But it was designed for two-way radio communication. You'd have maybe a ship in distress or a military problem, and that's what radio was designed for. It wasn't thought of as entertaining people. And then after radio had been around for a while, and uh, the man who was considered the hero of the Titanic uh, disaster where he stayed at his telegraph key, and he's uh, David Sarnoff, who became president of NBC, He had a thought in his mind that why can't we get an orchestra and we'll set up a radio network. His first network had 10 stations. He said, why can't we do this and have them in different stations around the country and people could listen? Because until radio came along, uh, someone that was out in Kansas or Nebraska or Mississippi or even Maine or wherever they might be would never have the opportunity to listen to classical music or opera or jazz or even a news commentator. They wouldn't have the chance to do that because there were no stations nearby and he certainly couldn't use one station and pick up the broadcast and send it all around the nation. He'd have to have separate stations and it worked out very very well because NBC and CBS both started in the 1920s and by the early 30s, they had had a serious effect on one important source of American entertainment. There were two kinds of, of entertainment going on before radio. There was burlesque, which was for adults, and there was vaudeville for family entertainment. And the nice thing about vaudeville is once you got famous, you were on a what they call a vaudeville circuit. And this might be 10 or 12 cities at a time, and there were probably a dozen different circuits where you'd start off in Philadelphia and maybe you'd go to Allentown or you'd go to Pittsburgh and Cleveland and things like that. And you could use the same material and the comedians like this because they didn't have to write new jokes. If you had a routine like Abbott and Costello with who's on first, you could do it every place you went to and then if you didn't get to a place for a year later you could do it over again because nobody's heard it for a year and it's still funny but the problem with the vaudeville people that wanted to get on radio sure it was a lot easier they didn't have to travel and stay in uh, seedy hotels sometimes or maybe drafty facilities or leaky faucets or whatever it might have been but the problem was the vaudeville vaudevillians ran out of material And, of course, that's not much fun. You've got to write everything over again. But by 1932, some of the greats, and you'll see them on the the picture with the four gentlemen. No, that's the one. That's the home radio, yes. And that shows you what a typical home would be like. You'd need a radio with about six knobs on it. You had a car battery-sized battery inside that set. They didn't plug them into the wall, and you had to charge it up. And then the next picture shows you the entertainers that we could see on the radio. There's Jack Benny up in the upper right, Red Skelton, Eddie Cantor, and Jimmy Durante. Now these men all started around 1932, and all of them had been vaudevillians, so they were used to the travel, and they found it was a lot easier. It's it's interesting that uh, one of the greats, uh, Bob Hope, who didn't get into radio until 1938, and he got into it by accident. He was a guest on the show when another entertainer couldn't make it. And he went through the thing, and radio was easy. You just read the script. You didn't have to memorize anything, and you just drop your old page on the floor and keep right on going. And he said to someone else, this is easy. He couldn't get over how simple it was. He had no idea. So it went uh, very, very well. Now, radio in the home in the 1930s, the early 30s, all the programs sounded like vaudeville. They were noisy and they they were fun, but it was not comforting. By the late 30s, the golden age of radio, which is generally accepted to be from the late 30s to the late 40s, you have professionalism, you have organized things, you have guests that... uh, came on. They switched between programs. Uh, A a fellow who was a detective character actor might go on a comedy show or a musician might go on a talk show and this just would be funny to listen to. 
and entertainers were happy with radio. The sponsors who kind of control things, there, again, there was never any worry about censorship with the uh, radio or even the movies in those days also. So it worked out very, very well. But the problem, one of the problems were that people could, that didn't have radios couldn't afford them because the depression was going on. Now, radio helped save the depression, but you've probably seen those little radios in department stores or gift shops. They call them the cathedral-style radio, which would it look like, a little miniature one. Not the Winchester Cathedral, but a, a regular cathedral. And they had about three or four tubes, and they were about $20 tops. And uh, people will tell me that you didn't have to pay for the whole radio at the time. You'd have a man come around your neighborhood. My mom told me this also, that uh, you'd, you'd give him a quarter a week to pay for your radio payment. And the depression uh, was very serious. A lot of people were out of work. But radio helped save, I think it saved an awful lot of sanity because you had comedy, you had drama, you had good music, symphony. Uh, I have a, an illustration on that program log slide that'll show you. Now, that's from 1934. Now, that's a New York City one, and uh, each major city that was on that network would have a thing. But this just covers the New York stations, and you've got... I don't know how well you can read them, but you have the Navy band doing a march thing. You have a singer doing a half hour, a baritone or an opera singer or what it might happen to be. And then tell you best bets on the air tonight and so forth. And all the newspapers had the radio logs. I've got some at home from the Meriden Morning Record. It shows you not only the network programs, but the local programs. You'd have 15 minutes of Johnny Jones singing something or... Uh, Mary Lou, uh, who was a singer, and she'd be singing also. So you always knew what was going on. I can remember seeing uh, in the Bridgeport paper, 800 Radio Row, referring to a station in Danbury. So it really made a big, big difference. And radio in the was, of course, in the laboratory. And then as the 30s went by, it became more and more available to people. It also was responsible for helping to bring electricity to rural areas because there were radios in the council radios that had a car battery to power them. They didn't have plug-in electricity because the kids didn't have electricity. My parents had a Zenith council radio, and it was a good set, but the price was about $120. Now, that's getting up there as far as dollars because in 1938, $1,500 a year was considered a, uh, an average uh, salary. That's uh, before taxes and everything else. So it just was different. But uh, I remember crawling on the floor one day, and I was very young, and behind the Xena set, looking at, expecting to find little people running around back there doing the voices, and I was very surprised no one was there. But uh, it does happen, I guess. I have a slide on uh, the Motorola slide. That's the next one on the uh, list there. Yes, and this shows you... What radio? Now, this is from January of 1946. Now, I have a couple dozen of similar ones, but I selected this one because it's got the various types of radios I want to talk about. But this means that this ad was probably done in the fall of 1945, and the war was ju just ended. And where the U.S. manufacturers were able to convert to war production, here they had to convert back to civilian production. So you see a few mentions in, in that ad that uh, when you get your new radio or it's worth the wait or something like that. And you can see along the bottom all the little things that Motorola made. They, they made aircraft radios, police radios, radar, and things like that. And you have the unit that the family is listening to. This, this company, there were two ways of advertising this type of equipment. You can see them with beautiful music, and they're, they've got the record changer on, and then... What they would do after that is on the right side on the top is where all the controls are, the radio dial. The lower left is where the speaker was. And the lower right, that's a closed cabinet where you can put all your records in there. And you can see that the family gets the big set. Now, that's set that size because it has FM on it. And we'll be getting into FM in future programs. But that's about, I would say, about $300 for that set. Now, that's some serious money. 
Now, the, the cute one, this, this is fun to look at this stuff because it brings back such a good time. Look at the one on the lower left. In, in mom's laboratory, with, my mom had a little kitchen set like that. That's what they used to call them, like that little white radio. They put it on top of the refrigerator and her soap operas would come out there or her stories as she called them. So that was kind of mom's domain because most of the moms stayed home in those days. Then you have another shot looking at the next one down, Dad's doghouse. Well, I don't know whether he did something wrong or not. He might have. You'd never really know. But that's for his den or whatever it might be. And then the little one in the bottom there for the Jumping Jivers. <laughs> and Jumping Jivers FM, I guess. But that is that is funny. you got a record changer and the kids. And so many times you'd go to someone's house and they've got, they call them combinations. Like that, and it was probably one of the biggest selling items. And TV came along, and they were added TV, giant 10 inch screen, things of that sort. But uh, it was just, it's just, it's just like going back again. And of course, they always advertised how much the company had contributed to war work. And of course, Motorola made their money, and they still do in police band and uh, all sorts of things. Now, I had one other one, which is uh, ready for this is. I, I didn't think of it when I was at home, but this is a different type of advertising for the same item. Now, that's Arthur Fiedler, the director of the Boston Pops. He's, what he's doing is telling how nice the sound is on the set that he's talking about by the Messner Company, who not only made radio combinations, but they did some early work in high fidelity, but they were out of business by the mid-'50s. But look at the picture on the left where the pre previous picture with the children and the family having a good time and then Arthur Fiedler has listened to a symphony thing and he according to him had never heard anything like that and uh, this was the other type of thing they had musicians or they'd have an instrumentalist of some kind or singers that would uh, telling how good their they thought the set was and uh, that was it was good good thing but there were cases where Sets weren't that good. I used to sell those when I was uh, first in college, and that was an interesting period of time also. The other thing that they mention on these uh, ads is you have to wait to get your radio where, where, when they come in because consumer goods, they had to convert back to them, so it made it a little bit difficult. And then an interesting thing that happened, uh, all the music on these this picture of the record changer or 78 RPM 10 inch or 12 inch records but you had had some fun in 1948 because I've got ads in 1948 they have a single speed for 78 RPM and then June of 78 or June of 48 rather Columbia came out with the 33 and the third LP record which would play about 45 minutes counting both sides so you had a I've got some ads that are from the fall of 1948, and they're mentioning two speeds. And then RCA is, uh, doesn't want to be left out, so they, in March of 1949, they come out with a little 45 RPM, the teenager's favorite throughout the 50s, that's for sure. And now you needed a three-speed unit. The reason, even a fourth speed that came out in the early 50s, called the, they call it the talking book, which is about all you could do with it as far as the sound quality, but that went at 16 and two-thirds, and that's really way, way down. But this shows you with the uh, pictures where the different sets were used, but there were only so many gadgets. They can only do so much with AM radios and with uh, records because you had scratches, they were fragile, and things like that. But, and mom would be concerned if you went out shopping for a radio, you're looking for veneers and the color and it, does it match the drapes or does it match something because that's kind of what you had to do. And they've got different color combinations. Now, almost none of the manufacturers made their own cabinets. I know Magnavox did make them, but there's only a few that did. But in fact, the radios that... Uh, the mom's laboratory one, the one that went, in the, the one with the soap operas, those are collectible, and there's companies and groups and clubs that uh, collect hundreds of those because you'd have a circuit. The circuits and the radios were about the same in all of them. They, there was nothing spectacular about them, but you might have a radio with a Mighty Mouse on it, or Roy Rogers, or somebody like that, or shaped like Hopalong Cassidy's hat or something, and this would be a regular radio. And this is what people collect. I think they call them Bakelite sets. 
but uh, it's just a, an interesting period of time. But uh, radio entered the home, and once it got accepted in the living room, it was a piece of furniture first and a radio second, but it's just so much uh, different. But uh, that's one of the great things about it. But radio got through the Depression, and also it helped to win the war because uh, war workers were tired after they worked uh, shifts seven days a week, and they could listen to Brogan Rims, and a lot of the Hollywood stars would be on the radio, the radio stars, and uh, just unbelievable. But, uh, and then, of course, the Depression, hearing all the music, but it really scared people sometimes because they weren't used to hearing uh, romantic music or symphonies and everything like that, and it helped, probably helped to save a few lives, too, and hopefully we can continue and uh, really enjoy it. This is Don Mino, and uh, we've been visiting with the radio. I see, I look at those pictures, it's like being a four-year-old kid again. It's unbelievable. We'll see you next time.